Mr. St. Julian. Thank you. I find myself in a rather odd state of mind today. Rather emotionally blank right now. Part of that is having to do this again. Part of that is I'm mostly a private person. And the idea of having to pour my heart out again is irritating. And I can't match the eloquent words that have come before me in the previous impact statements. So I'll limit my my words today. The defendants, through their choices, through their indifference and gross negligence, enabled the son, their son to murder my daughter, Hannah, and three other children. They chose to stay quiet. They chose to ignore the warning signs. And now, as we've heard through all of the objections, <coughs> They continue to choose to blame everyone but themselves. Every single ob objection, I think, that the council said this morning, put the blame somewhere else, their son, not them. I stood before the court several months ago and spoke about the impact that Hannah's murder had on myself and my family. Nothing has changed since then. It's impossible for me to truly convey the complete impact of my daughter's loss. Hannah's murder has destroyed a large portion of my very soul. I've said these words before, it's still the truth. I remain a shell of the person that I used to be. I think of her and miss her constantly. Every day is a battle to attempt to move forward, to struggle to get out of bed, to go through the motions of everyday life. Simple everyday sights and actions bring pain, as I think what it should have been like with Hannah there with us. I think of all the good times that we've shared together as a family, and more on all of the memories that will never be. I will never think back fondly on her high school and college graduations. I will never walk her down the aisle as she begins the journey of starting her own family. I am forever denied the chance to hold her or her future children in my arms. A few words describing Hannah can in no way fully capture her truly beautiful caring soul, or impart, impart her unlimited, unlimited potential. Hannah was absolutely beautiful and thoughtful person. She was always the first person to notice when someone had a problem and the first to go out of her way to offer help. She was incredibly curious and talented. She continually tried new things. She crafted homemade jewelry, tried cooking her own recipes, and played several sports. She was a record holder in track and a leader of her school <coughs> volleyball and basketball teams. She also hoped to join her older sister on the lacrosse team in the spring. She had aspirations of her career dedicated to helping people. All of this is lost because of the defendant's actions and choices. My position regarding the defendant's sentencing and their future has evolved through their trials. At first, I was focused on the importance of getting a, a guilty verdict, to have the message conveyed to the public that this type of behavior and choices are not acceptable. I didn't have strong feelings about their sentencing. It was just something that would be determined by the system. My view, however, 
has changed as the defendant's level of defiance has grown. Instead of acknowledging any mistakes, they continue to show no remorse. They take no accountability. They and their lawyers continue to try to change the narrative and portray the defendants as victims of the prosecution team. They blame everyone but themselves and make threats of retribution. The facts have already been presented. The jury has found them guilty. Multiple juries have found them guilty. Hannah, Madison, Tate, and Justin are the ones who have lost everything, not the defendants. As such, I ask that this court to sentence the defendants to the maximum allowable penalty of 10 to 15 years in prison. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here.